Welcome to the uh, Phantom Works podcast. I'm Dan Short, and this is, I guess, it's podcast number one, season one. And uh, uh, we've got like 50 seasons planned, so please, actually, we don't, but stay with us for the for the long haul. Um, today, I'm uh, going to talk to a, a guest of mine. Um, many of you have heard of him. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, he, he lives in the middle of a cornfield. I mean, if you ever visit this guy's place, just look for corn that you can't see over and just keep driving through it, and eventually this house will pop out, and, and you're going to be at the residence of Joe Zolper. Many of you will know him as uh, the pretty face and the main mechanic in uh, the show called Garage Squad, but Joe is really the, the main character of the show. Um, I'm, I want to talk to him today. I know your dad was a, uh, a farmer. I'm sorry, your grandfather was a farmer, right? Yes, that is correct. Yes. And actually, there was a time in my life I wanted to be a farmer. Well, and, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because you live on a farm, but I understand you don't currently farm it, or do you? No, I just live on three acres out in the middle of nowhere surrounded by farm fields. Okay. Uh, actually, my friends that are the neighbors farm all the land around me. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so you're not farming, even though you shouldn't. And, and I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to, you know, correct <laughs> that during this, because farming is, I think, a, a very important thing to do now and, and getting more and more important as the, the, the clock ticks on, right? Um, yes. But uh, you, you started in life. Now, I understand your first car was, what, an 82 Honda Accord? Was yes. It? It, it's one of the things that, I, you know, I don't really want to remember. You know, that was my first car. It's a little embarrassing, but... That car got me and my dad and my family around for a very, very long time. And one thing led to another. And I bought it off my dad when I was 16. And so, yes, I had to say that that was my first car, which is depressing. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that sucks. I, I wouldn't admit to it personally. I, I make no. up a story, okay? Just, just come up with something better than an 82 Honda. My first car right. was a 67 Camaro. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like every other Chevy guy out there, right? Yeah. Come on, you you gotta Come love Chevrolet. On. You gotta love Chevrolet. Well, the Chevrolet. reason why it had to be a Honda Accord is because Mopars are so expensive. That that's why. Yeah, they are. Um, <laughs> look, we, we we've restored a number of Mopars, I, and I know you you specialize in Mopar. I mean, that's that's your car, and 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 the 426 is your motor, and and don't get yeah. me wrong, I. I, I have great love for the elephant and and the Mopar. I, I have great love for them, but you can't you can have, you can build five Chevys for the price of about one or two Mopars. Yes, that is correct, and that's why one thing you've got to always remember, Dan, you got to have respect for the Mopar community because it's harder to find all the parts. The swap meets, you know, are harder to come by. And the challenge of building one, let alone the finances, you've got to respect the Mopar guy in, you know, 2023. Well, but but I'm going to share with you a story from a diehard Mopar man in my area. His name's Ed. He's like 83, 84 years old. And um, he told me, like, like, have you ever looked at the production numbers of the Challenger, which the Challenger Cuda, same car, kind of um, most beautiful car, in my opinion, that Dodge probably ever made. Um, I, I love it. And did you know that the production numbers went down every year on the Challenger? But, you, but, but the important part is why. And this is where, although I love them, I have to acknowledge reality. Why did production numbers go down on the Challenger every single year? Uh, well, I, in my opinion, because it's just opinion, I don't know the facts, is I think the CUDA kind of took over as far as looks goes. And then, well, then after 71, everything went you know, because the gas. So, uh, and, and then the challengers got even uglier. So, I mean, I think that all had something to do with it. I think it did. But what he claims, and and I and I don't find it probably untrue, is he said the initial quality of the challenger was so bad that they were losing customers and less people wanted to buy them each year. So, while I yeah. love the Mopar, the reality is, is the fit, the finish. The quality and then finding good used parts, that's that's tougher than it is for even Chevy and Ford. So well that and also keep in mind that when you know when we're redoing these cars today, we are making them way better than they ever were made out of the factory. I mean, door oh, man, I said that and I got black mask. eyes for that. What's that? I said that on air on like my first episode, and I got a black eye for that, that we're making them better than they were. 
They, we are, and, and I'll flat out tell you, I mean, anyone who thinks we're not, you're delusional. Maybe you just don't remember, you know, 1971. Granted, I wasn't born, but I have found cars, you know, with 30,000 original miles on them. And, and I'm here to tell you, it was the most slapped together hunk of crap that there was back then. I mean, I mean, what we're doing with door gaps alone, just, just those two words, door gaps is way above what they were doing in 70, 71. Nobody cared back then. You got to remember back then it'd be no different than slapping together a Prius. It was just another car going down the line. It's now they have value. I, I got two things to say. Number one, I thought you were older than me, so I thought you were born way before 71. And, and, number, <laughs> and number two, um, I have two words for you about door gaps. Phantom Orcs does amazing door gaps. Those are my two words. So, oh, nice, nice. You, I, I you know, that. there's other people that talk like that too. So, um, I am 45 years old, going on 16 at best, according okay. to my wife. All right, all right. I'll, I, I'll I, listen, I am the, yeah, I'm still a big kid. I mean, it's pathetic. I'm not going to lie. All right. Now, I, I just, I, I need to tell the story of how I met you because it was actually pretty cool. I called you guys up one day. And, and the first thing was immediately you took the call, which I thought was very cool. And, and I told you that we were coming through to do Route 66. And I mean, how far are you off of, isn't it, what, what is the highway that has now replaced Route 66 coming that Bob blows through Joliet? Interstate 55? Yeah. So we're coming down I-55, and I can't remember whether it was me or someone else, but we had a problem with one of the cars on the trip. And so I thought, yeah. wait a second, I think Joe's somewhere around here. So I gave you a call, you answered the phone and, and I said, Hey man, I, I need a lift and we, we got to do a little bit of work on the car. You're like, come on over, have lunch. And, and so <laughs> not only did you greet my entire party, but you had the entire crew of the show over at your house also having lunch. So that was very cool. If you really think about it, and I kind of look at, you know, what we do on TV is a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. I mean, it's a lot of things in our profession that, you know, let's be honest, we don't really have to be doing. I mean, I made a very healthy living long before Garage Fund. And uh, so I kind of, you know, we're all kind of family in a sense. We're all in the same boat. We're all trying to get good content out there. We're all trying to share our knowledge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let, let me, I'm, I'm, people constantly say to me, well, like you're a TV star. And I just laugh at that. I mean, I, I laugh yeah, for several too. reasons. I'm. I'm, I'm a guy that yeah. owns a garage that they point a camera at occasionally. But have you ever felt like a TV star ever? No. Yeah. No. I, 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 well, first of all, even if I want – now, when you say TV star, I'm going to look at that as the, as the, like, maybe toward the negative side of that statement. You know, uh, you know I, 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 I'm, I don't run around big-headed. I'm not that guy. I mean, I, my pants are dirty right now. I'm putting an LS motor together in a shop, and I'm going to go to lunch here when I'm done. I don't really care. My flannel's all ripped up. I, I am just a guy. And, um, you know, so, no, I, I, uh, it, it's, it's just it's hard to say exactly how I feel about this uh, adventure that I have been on as far as, uh, you know, we'll call it, let's just say the words of being famous. But the reality is, let me tell you something about being famous, all the listeners out there. Uh, first of all, be careful what you wish for, number one, okay? Number two, being reality star famous is not what it's cracked up to be. And hear me out on this, okay? So as you well know, you've been to my house, you've been to my shop and, and everything. And, you know, there's no gate. I got no gated community, right? I got people come down my driveway all the time. Being reality star famous is, uh, it really kind of sucks because you're not going to be Hollywood famous. And Hollywood famous has money that comes with it. Reality star don't have money. So I don't have security guards. I don't have gates. I, you know, I'm just out in the public and and, uh, you know, you get what you get. So all the horror stories you hear about the famous people in Hollywood, you just got to accept the fact that that's what you're going to deal with if you're reality star famous, because you don't have the money to, you know, get your own spot at the back of the restaurant, per se. You, you don't get your privacy. I mean, I got I've had people come down my driveway at 11 o'clock at night, you know, trying to get on the TV show. 
six o'clock in the morning. I'm not even lying. Six o'clock in the morning. My daughter's trying to get on the bus, scared the hell out of my daughter. She had to run back to the house. Some guy's creeping down the driveway, you know, uh, wanting to get his car on the show. Uh, I've dealt with it all. I've seen it all. And I have been out to dinner and I had a guy one time, he sat at the table across from me, never ordered food, never ordered nothing to drink, never nothing. I sat there, had dinner with my friends and family. When we got up to leave, he shoved his cell phone in my face and showed me a street route he wants to get on the show. The street <laughs> route that's done, my bad. So it's not like, you know, it, you know, everyone says, well, you get what you get if you want to be on TV. Yeah, but, you know, you're, 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 conf you're confusing Brad Pitt and, and Dan Short. And trust me, there's a giant difference there, right? Well, not, not in looks, not, but, but, but in looks. checkbook, yeah. Right. Yeah, but you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, it, but you know what, though? As long as I get to teach people the things that I know, I deal with it. It's all okay. right. In this beautiful house is a picture of an unhealthy family. But what if they can make a better choice in the evening time as they unwind? What if they watch stories that were true, that were good, that were beautiful? Introducing C-Max TV. Live life to the max, C-Max. One of the things that I insisted when we did the show was that my life in the shop and the, the life of my crew would change as little as possible. So in other words, we just took in clients, just like we always did. We charged the clients to build their cars and we delivered their cars. We just did it while a camera sort of followed it. But for you, the entire construct of your garage changed radically with the show, right? Um, yeah, it went dead and empty. It was stressful as hell, especially in the beginning, the first three years, I was doing it all. I mean, I was doing everything from, I don't give a rat, but what anybody says, I was directing, I was producing, I was uh, being a mechanic, I was being talent, I was the parts guy, I was the organizer, I mean, I, you name it, I did everything, which made it really, really miserable for me. Um, in order to get the show uh, up and going. The truth of the matter is the end of season three, I actually quit the show uh, because I wasn't getting any help. I was begging, begging for help uh, behind the scenes and, uh, and off camera. And I just wasn't getting the respect and wasn't getting it. So I quit. I'm like, I'm out. I'm like, I can't do it, you guys. I mean, it, I was showing up on set sometimes with three, four hours sleep. Uh, you know, bags under my eyes. I'm cranky. I'm crabby. And uh, I just said, I'm done. I'm not doing it no more. So uh, Velocity stepped in and they basically gave me a promotion and uh, had other people in charge after that about parts and so on and so forth and kind of made my life a little easier. Then I just focused on the builds, who was doing what, you know, help producing, help directing, so on and so forth. Um, and it wasn't until the last season of Garage Squad I even got the respect for that where uh, they made me a, a, a producer the last season. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, it should have been done, you know, that should have been done way beforehand. But uh, yeah. I, I, I know when I called you on a number of occasions, you were literally on the road running around picking up parts to do yeah. the builds. Um, yeah. So... You had to build cars very differently than I did. My average build on this show is about one year long because it takes a year to get in all the parts and do the sanding and do the paint work and do the reassembly and rewire the car. You really were, like, what was your average time from when you showed up until you guys drove away with a car that was either finished or not? How long did you have, typically? Uh... The beginning on our half hour episodes, we had about three and a half days. When we hit one hour episodes, we roughly had five to six. Five or six days. Yeah. You want me to come down here and show you how to do it? I, I would love ah! to know <laughs> how to build a car in five days. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joe, hey, you, anytime yeah. you want to come down and school me on that, believe me, I will sit there with my notepad and my camera 
and uh, probably mostly laugh, but um, yeah. Yeah. Were you happy with the kind of work you were doing? Because let's let's just establish something. Can you really do a quality build in five days? If it doesn't involve paint and body work and it's mechanical and you got some bad butt mechanics, yes. If you have all parts, yes, it can be done. Now, keep in mind, though, we're not doing restorations. That's the difference between us and you. See, we don't do restorations. We're, we are the guy that, you know, Someone tore apart the car and needs to get it back together. We're, we're putting it back together. We're not doing 100-point restos. That's, that, that's never what this show was. So keep that in mind. We are about, you know, freshening up motors, transmissions, rear ends, uh, getting interior done. Tell me how you freshen up a motor start to finish in five days. So explain that one to me because my fastest turnaround time for pulling a motor, disassembling the engine, magnafluxing it, you know, tanking it, magnafluxing it, uh, boring it, uh, line boring, honing, um, uh, getting the right pistons, degreeing a cam, rebuilding the heads, valve jobs. I, if I can do that in 30 to 45 days, I feel like I'm, I'm like conquering the world. How do you do that in less than five days? Uh, well, first things first, you got to have a good machine shop in your back pocket that is understanding what we're up against. So uh, you got to have a machine shop that's willing to work long hours in the night. We actually had a machine shop, Begler's Performance. I'm going to give them a shout out because they work very, very hard. Um, and, you know, and a lot of next day Aaron parts. But, I mean, but that, how do you know truth. what parts you need for that engine before you open it up? You don't. Because you don't know if someone's touched it. You don't know if it's been bored out. You don't know none of it. So so how are you ordering, you know, bearings for, for the crank based on turning the crank? How are you bear, uh, ordering pistons and rings? How are you ordering valve guides or springs or anything else when you have no idea until you rip it apart? How do you do that? You literally rip it apart the very first day that we are there. And you start logging everything you need, and then it's just a mass manhunt or a part hunt between you, a couple of the guys there working with me, and the machine shop doing whatever we can to round up parts. If we got to drive up north to get parts and take them back down all the way to the machine shop, then so be it. But yes, it is a rat race. It's a lot of work. Like, like I got to tell you, I ordered a crankshaft a month ago. Nine months lead time. Nine months, not nine minutes, not nine hours, nine months. So how did yeah. you solve those issues? Either uh, you tell the company, you know, listen, we need this crank. We're doing a TV show. We have X amount of time. What's it going to cost? We throw money at it. Or B, they're nice enough to understand and they watch the show and they respect what we're doing and the time frame we're in. And they try to move us to the head of the line. Or you find another alternative, whatever it takes. If not, you find a whole other motor. So you're the reason I was waiting nine months for crankshafts. Probably, yes. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're a jerk. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. All right, so, yeah. so were you generally happy with the builds you were doing? 50-50. Uh, with, with some of these builds, you know, the one thing I always tell everybody is at no point in time are these cars 100% done when we leave. That's not what Garage Squad was all about. It was about, you know, getting you up, moving along a lot farther than you were. You can go back and tweak everything from there. Uh, if it was at my shop, most of the stuff wasn't too bad, honestly. Some stuff, no, I, would not, I wasn't happy when we left. So the the... Obviously, the TV show, the Garage Squad was the TV show, and the TV show was Garage Squad, because your garage is actually called Prison City, right? Prison City Customs, yes. Okay, so Prison City Customs was never on the show, right? Never. Oh, no. Okay, so, so you transitioned from Garage Squad back to Prison City Customs, right? Yes, All right. and like you told me a long time ago when, when we first met, Phantom Works helps sustain a business for you. The show. Garage Squad does not help sustain a business for me. Right. So, so I, I know we, we talked a lot about the fact that your business 
which was your garage, Prison City Customs, basically kind of went defunct as a result of the TV show, right? Yes. But I just couldn't do it all. But the TV show paid so much money, it didn't matter, right? Well, uh, at no point in time did the TV show pay me more money than I made Prison City before the TV show. At no point in time. Okay. So, so in other words, it was about a zero-sum game for you? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It was about an opportunity. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you just got to bite and take that opportunity and not pay attention to the dollar signs to go do something, you know, what you love doing. So. But, but I guess the point I'm making is Garage Squad did not lead to, like, this big pot of cash at the end of the rainbow for you. No, no. And it definitely didn't do anything for my business uh, because – I mean, just, just Monday morning, a uh, guy called and uh, wanting free work done or uh, wanting to get on the show. And I probably deal with those calls, we'll just say, multiple times a week. Uh, I also deal with people that literally think that when I'm not filming Garage Squad, that's what I do. I just go around people's garage and work on their cars for free. Oh, yeah. So you don't? My business? Because, Joe, I've got uh, this car in my garage that I really, you know, I mean, I figured, yeah. come on over, man. Yeah, yeah. And... uh so has, has Garage Squad done anything for my company itself uh, as far as getting work? I'm going to be honest with you. I keep track of the numbers. So does my wife. Uh, in nine years of Garage Squad, our profit has been just over $14,000 in work that has come from the TV show. Nine years. That's our profit. From customers that have showed up that know me from the TV yeah. show. And come in, that's where I'm at in nine years. Well, the, the problem you faced, and, and, and I sort of saw the, 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 the signs on the wall, was that your show was about doing free, fast work when Prison City Customs was not about doing either free or fast work. It was about being a garage and doing custom work, which is not fast and it's definitely not free. So, so yeah. your show worked against you where that was the one thing where I kind of won. I made sure that Phantom Works represented us. Notice on our show, we were never out there playing goofy golf and, you know, throwing, yeah. throwing hammers at windshields of cars just for fun and doing all that stupid stuff. We were actually right. just seriously building cars. So yeah. I, I made sure that the show sort of propped up the business rather than than took away from it and and I know that was tough for you. So so look, I'm I'm stepping back into the fire, but you are too. So why are you going back into, you know, something that didn't pay and and here you are looking to do it again? Are are is it is it the the drug? Uh no, it's about the knowledge in my eyes. Um I felt that uh you know, I could probably do my own TV show uh, to where the viewers are going to fall in love with the fact of, uh, you know, keeping it real. You know, I mean, that's the one thing I will give Garage Squad credit. We didn't get in no drama either as far as, you know, we weren't, you know, uh, we weren't fighting, yelling, screaming, none of that. I don't think that that's need, needed. So I guess basically uh, a lot of people in the industry feel that uh, as a gearhead, and with the accomplishments made, you know, with Garage Squad, keep in mind it takes a village. Okay, I, I'm not the I'm not the one that saves Garage Squad or anything like that. But I think uh, I have, you know, learned a lot to where enough where I believe that if I do a TV show, I can give the viewers what is that what it is that they exactly want uh, versus some of the yes. stuff that's out there now that is just let's be honest, it's it's just kind of great. You know, yeah. How about we use that one? Yeah. You know where I'm going, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I'm starting. Yes, I'm starting my own TV show. Yes.
so what about the cost of it? It's not cheap, is it? No, no, it is not cheap. Uh, you know, right now in today's day and age, anybody can have a YouTube channel. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I mean, you can kind of slap something together for 10, 20 grand and, and maybe get it on some unheard of streaming platform. You know, one of the thousands that keep getting created every, every year. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, and where's my show going to go? You know, I don't know yet myself on where it's going to end up, but yeah, I'm putting a lot of skin in the game on this one. Yes. Does your yeah, wife I am now good. I am now the producer, the I'm executive producer. I own the production. And uh, I feel as a gearhead, you know, um, it, the way I look at it, let's look at it like this. Uh, with my accomplishments that I have done, that I'm proud of, and, and where I led things with my career, you know, you, you get some of these networks out there. You can hire a producer that doesn't know the difference between a lug nut and a spark plug to make your show. Or you can find a guy like me that understands how to make the show, understands what gearheads want to see, and understands how to do be a producer. I mean, why, why would you go anywhere else? Is my okay, answer. so you do know the difference between a lug nut and a torque wrench? Uh, well, the lug nut is what goes on the spark plug wire. Goes okay, on. okay, all right. So I just wanted yeah. to make sure you weren't just okay. talking in, in, in metaphors. You actually do. All right, so good. You do know the difference. <laughs> Um, so let me ask you, I, I know that you've, you've got a family and, and you've, you've got a wife. Does, how does she stand behind what you're doing or does she, or is she, has she locked you out of the house and said you're sleeping in the garage? Uh, actually, you know, my wife has been dealing with some health issues for the last four years. And this year she says to me, and I quote, you need to get off your rump and you need to do this. And okay. It's time. And okay, so she she wants you out of the house. Okay. Yes, yes. And, and I've been waiting on this, you know, to do this for a while, you know, but the reality is is, you know, I, I need a I need to practice what I preach. You can't wait for the right time for anything. And and that's what I was doing. And I know that. If you wait you know for the what? perfect yeah, if you wait for the perfect yeah. time, it, it never shows up. Never show. So I'm just gonna do it. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, we actually start filming uh next Friday. Okay. Actually, yes. I mean, so when I say we're doing it, I mean, we're going all in. Okay. Well, I wish you guys speed with that. It's uh, it, it's tough. We've been filming here now for, what, seven, seven months? Has it been seven months? Yeah. Goodness. That's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a long time. And, 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 and we're still... Our average show on Phantom Works took 12 to 18 months, each show. Uh, we're, we're trying to compress that schedule a little bit, but we have not yet finished editing our first actual hour-long release. We're getting closer. In fact, we've got, you know, we, we were just having a discussion. We've got six hours that are currently being filmed now. So you figure my, my first year of Phantom Works was six shows. So we were doing exactly the same size as the first year we did at Phantom Works only. We, we had slightly larger and deeper pockets than, you know, I'm yeah. dealing with. So we're, we're doing yeah. our best here. Um, so so you're, you're about to start on this venture. Your family supports it. Yes. Yeah? All right. And, 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 and in the end... Be honest, because I, I think you're going to probably, you know, give me a line of crap here, but are oh, you... No, not me. Oh, yeah, I'm going to... Yeah, you, you... Okay, we'll ah. see. Are you doing oh. it because you think there's money in it? Are you doing it because you think there's fame in it? Or are you just an absolutely altruistic, amazing human being doing it for the better good of humanity? None of the above. Oh, really? None of the above? I'm doing it because I'm so tired of the fake crap going around this industry and that's why I'm doing it. That's why the race is, uh, we're filming a race. We're filming people that build their own cars. It's called the Builder's Brawl. Um, and it's this year in May, Memorial Day weekend's the main event. And I'm filming it because I'm so tired of, we'll just take my daughter for example, okay? I am so tired of her going on social media and seeing the girls in the industry. For an example, because this is not just about picking on girls there's a lot of men too that you know they're showing off their stuff to get car parts and to get famous and 
you know, and sponsors. And what is that really teaching my daughter? And if you sit and watch what's going on in the industry, where is the real part of, you know, drag racing gone? I mean, uh, you know, years ago, you know, back in your day, drag racing was about... <laughs> back, back when the Model <laughs> Ts were getting yeah. ready to launch for the first start. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, back then it was, you know, usually the driver was building the motors, building the cars and doing all the work. And now we have got so far away from that, that we're not showcasing talent anymore in drag racing. And there's so much of it. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's amazing what these guys do out of their garages. So wait a second. You're, you're, you do a thing called no prep racing. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. No. What's a no prep race? Uh, whenever you go to the drag strip, usually they spray a glue on the drag strip and then they drag it with old rubber tires and it makes the track very, very sticky. So massive amounts of horsepower can stick to the track and make good numbers. No prep is we show up uh, at my race, uh, my style, no prep. We show up, we blow off the track and you get what you get. So uh, it's... It takes a lot of knowledge to get a car to go down that surface uh, and run some fast numbers. Okay. And again, that's why I like no prep. I understand it's on a ragged edge. Some people think it's stupid. Uh, but the reality is, Dan, I mean, usually a lot of the old timers are saying no prep is stupid are the same guys that were watching, you know, Don Garlis go down the track smoking the tires at 200 miles an hour, you know? So uh, to me, it's about going back to your roots and the challenge. Okay. Now, does your wife or daughter ever drive? Uh, my daughter's got a junior dragster. She's not 16 yet. Uh, she drag races. And yes, my wife uh, has a blown alcohol car uh, and she drag races, but because of her health, she hasn't been. But we are in the middle of building her a 69 Daytona herself, blown alcohol Hemi. She's already built her motor. It's been sitting in the corner. And now we're waiting for her to get better, and then we're going to finish building the car. She really don't want me touching it without her. I okay. So who's got the fastest times in your family? That would be me. Unless oh, I go in. Sh- I knew you that. were going to say that. Yeah, no. There was, now listen. Now listen. Listen. There was that's... a time. My wife was faster than me, and it was the worst three years well, of my life. Well, that's what I heard. I, I heard your wife was actually much faster than you. Yes, for a little while, three years, long enough. <laughs> Well, dur- during, during the peak years of both of your racing, I understand she was a lot better than you. So I, I, I know that that's got to that's gotta hurt. Yeah, you know, it, it, so. it hurt a lot. Yeah. So, so is, is that why she's got health? I mean, that's not why she's got health issues, because she was faster than you, is she? I mean, you didn't, you didn't do that, right? I plead the fifth. Okay, all right. okay, all right. So what kind of, what kind of are you racing 10th? Um, a uh, thousand feet. Are you racing quarter mile? What are you, what are you racing? Uh, I race both quarter mile and eighth mile. My race is eighth mile. All no prep racing is eighth mile. Uh, it just seems to be that the industry is going. So you don't want to be changing that up because people set their cars up for that. So. What kind of eighth mile times do you, your wife and your daughter have? Oh, uh, three answers. Junior tracks, or I don't know. My wife's. You don't know five. what your own daughter's doing. Shame on you. Well, she run. She uh, I just, uh, I just, she? just, 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 seven nineties. She's seven nineties in weight. Yeah, okay. my wife is in the mid fives, and I'm in the uh, mid to low fours uh, with my car. Now I'm building a new motor, so I'm hoping to break into the threes this year. Okay, so that's yes. pretty quick. That's pretty quick. That's probably almost as fast as what I have in my, uh, you know, in my garage at home. So that's that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So actually, I, I I know you don't care, but but I'm going to tell you why I'm doing a show. Um, yes. No, actually, that was my next question. Is, oh, is, I'm sure is, it was. No, I'm serious. I want to know after the torture you went through the first time, you know, it's like it's like licking an ice cream cone, Dan. You get the ice cream headache and you just keep licking. OK, so yeah. why are you doing this again? Um, for me, it's it's about. Look, I, I've got this dream, and, and, and so my, my dream is not just to tell, just to say that I can do it in the industry. It, it has really nothing to do with that. My dream is about a catamaran um, somewhere around Fiji 
six yes. years from now. That that's my dream. I I I want to see crystal clear, uh, you know, waters on under azure blue skies with white sand beaches, and and my wife and I stepping off our catamaran onto our zodiac and going up on on board the the, the shore uh, in in Fiji, and and so to get there. Um, and, and by the way, my boat, um, I've, I've already started working on it, uh, you know, off-grid capable. We're talking about solar panels, uh, water desalination systems, a chicken wow. coop. Um, you know, <laughs> wow. I, I mean, I, I'm talking about a boat where we're going to produce our own water, our own power, and our own mostly wow. food. Uh, obviously, the, the sea and, and God provide an abundance of that. So, so to get there... I've, I've started this sort of off-grid life. I, I live on a farm. I produce, well, I don't. My, my chickens produce the eggs. My pigs produce the pork. My, my cows produce the beef. But, you know, I make sure yeah. that they have the grass and the, uh, you know, the, the nutrients that they need. And, and so what I discovered is that this, this life has given me a sense of freedom that you can't even imagine. Like, don't get me wrong. I feel badly for people that go to the grocery store and have to pay $8 a dozen for eggs if they can get them, you know, that, that are paying, you know, eight bucks a pound for butter when they can get it. Um, I don't worry about those things because I'm producing all of my own eggs and butter and bread and milk and beef and pork and chicken and turkey. We're just producing all of our own. And, and, and God basically is doing that, right? All I do is yeah. sort, of, sort of do what I'm told and I make sure that the chickens have the food and the grass and the bugs and the, the cows have what they need. And so when I, was, when I was really starting this off, everybody was asking me, you know, what is it like? And, and it's, it's a sense of freedom. I mean, it's, that, that's the best word I can put on it. It gives you a freedom that you can't even imagine. And so I decided if I can bring a few thousand, a few million people along on this journey and, and sort of inspire them to not be so dependent on grocery stores where, do you have any idea how much estrogen is laced in the meat that you're eating from the grocery store? Are you aware that your testosterone levels are 20% lower than your father's were at the same age? Did you know that? Oh, I, yes, I, I read up on it. I totally, I mean, 100% agree. So, so we're Even being- our handshake is weaker. Oh, it is. We, we as men are becoming weak. Our society yes. is becoming uh, literally, we are being poisoned with estrogen. Our, our milk is saturated with chemicals. Everything that we're eating and, and, and buying at the grocery stores, not everything, but many, many of the things are basically poisonous. And, and so not only am I producing my own, but I'm producing my own without all those chemicals. And, and so I'm trying to take people along in this journey. Well, in order to take them along in the journey, I need to reach out to them. And that's what, that's what the show is about. We're building cars. We're building cars that do cool off-grid things. And we're doing other off-grid things like milking cows and building solar panel arrays that follow the sun and produce enough energy so that not if, but when the grid goes down, I don't really care. I've got silent energy that will last as long as, as, long as the sun is in the sky, I'm, 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 I'm good. And so for me... We're doing it at a farm, I'm doing it on a boat, and I'm taking people along on the journey, and, and that's why I'm doing it. I wanna show them, and, and, and I'll be honest, in the end, if I can make a few dollars and, and, and help pay for some fuel and, and some uh, food and some things that I have to at least start off on the boat with, then that's why I'm doing this. I, I wanna live well, a, a very cool life. Well, now that you built a watch, Best I'm going to do is a 1988 Stratus bass boat with a hole in it. I mean, that's about as good as it's going to get, and I'm going to drown a worm. If I can make it to that level, Dan, I'm proud of you. You be proud of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not moving any gears at that point. Phantom Works is working hard. Come along for the ride. Can we work on a 1980 or 81? 80. 80. El Dorado, absolutely. What's the better question? Will we? Will we? Not a chance in Hades. Featuring Dan Short and his army of restoration technicians. 
I know we're labeled mechanics and car builders, but the reality is at Phantom Works, we're really more about connecting people and the memories of their cars one more time. Watch complete restorations. I'd like to change this. Resto mines and rebuilds from the ground up. Pushing the limits from vintage to off-grid and beyond. I've also wanted to do an EMP vehicle. As a matter of fact, EMP falls right in line with what we're doing. Don't miss a single adventure with Phantom Works. Subscribe and click the bell today. Look, Joe, I, I absolutely wish you all the best. Um, you know, drag racing is one of those things where, I'll, I'll be honest, the fastest drag race times I've ever had were uh, 10 and a half, 11 seconds in the quarter. I mean, so not, nothing at the level you're talking about. I, if you're doing four second eights, I'm imagining you're only, that's, that's at the level of doing what, about a seven second quarter, something Six. like that? Yeah, high sixes. Okay, and, and that's a quantum leap from a 10 and a half second quarter. I mean, a quantum yes. leap, right? I'm, I'm dealing with 600 horsepower, 800 horsepower in a 3,000 pound vehicle. You're probably what, at 1,500 horsepower? 2500 25 okay so so we're 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 worlds apart on that um and and yeah. and I got to tell you I I've, I've always wondered if I was brave enough to strap my back into a 3.9 second eighth mile car why do you do it is it fun cuz let's face it something goes wrong and you're that little tiny pink splatter at the end of the runway or or in this case the drag strip uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's something that's in your mind every time you strap in. Do I think you can do it? I think you can do it. Why don't you come out to the Builders Brawl on Friday, Memorial Day weekend, and I'll strap you in something and ship you down the track. Now, you may look like Wiley Coyote on a rocket, but I'm going to get you in that <laughs> direction going down the track. Uh, how about you come and do that? Well, think about that, because I got to tell you, it's always intrigued me. I mean, I watch it in awe, and, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for guys like you and gals like your wife and your daughter who do it, because it does take a lot of nerve. I mean, I can scare the living crap out of people taking them out with 500 horsepower and, and, and power sliding, you know, drifting around turns at 60 miles an hour. I can scare the, the bejesus out of them doing that. I imagine you could probably scare a lot of people with a four second eighth. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, there's a lot of people. In fact, you know, at our race, one of the rules is you have to shift your car. Okay. You, you know, a lot of these guys got air shift, automatic yeah. RPM timing shift. And we got people that will not come and compete because, you know, they, they run fives and they won't shift their car. And my attitude toward that is pretty harsh is, if you can't shift your car at the speed you're going, you probably shouldn't be going that speed. Yeah, and I mean, so do you use an air shifter? You're not using a traditional like hydraulic. Right here, hang in, bang them gears. Yes. Okay. So you, all right. So basically, obviously, you're just bypassing the clutch, and you're just, you're just, you're basically RPM matching, right? For for your yeah, shift. Yeah. Everything. Everything racing now is pretty much automatic, but you're still shifting. You know, like I got a. A link oh, that's with the lightning rods. Yeah. It's air operated, but you still have to manually shift it. Uh, we just don't allow any automatic shifting. And uh, because, well, that's just part of the challenge. Pro stock guys run 650s and compete every weekend on NHRA and they ship their car. So my attitude is if we're going to be the builder's brawl is all about coming back to its roots, well, then you're shifting too. Yeah. And boy, do some of these guys get mad and we don't care. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's pretty Man cool. Up. All right, I'll yeah. think because I will tell you I hate driving an automatic transmission. I, if if I can't shift it eight or nine grand, which is why I drive some cars that I can actually shift it up to about ninety five hundred RPM. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. In fact, my wife, you know, we're putting a, a two speed in her car, and she's having a fit with me because she's like, I want you know. If she had her, if she had her way, she'd have an 18 double over out of a Kenworth in there. I mean, she loves banging gears going down the track. So, but uh, when, you know, it's just, 
is to me, it's part of the fun. It's part of the excitement and learning your car and knowing the sound of your engine and watching that tack. It, and it all happens so fast. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, you're 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 watching that tack go from what are you probably off the line before you before you step in it? What are you, 2,500, 3,000 RPM just to just to yeah. keep it spooled? And and yeah. then what what are you shifting at? Seven ish? Nine. Nine? Oh, okay. Nine, so nine. you really are you taking it up to nine. All right. So yeah. so you're going from three to nine in what, probably one point five seconds? Oh yeah, 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 maybe, yeah. Yeah, it comes pretty quick. That's pretty intense. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I've, I've driven a lot of motors that spooled up quick, but not that quick. You know, I mean, if if I'm spooling up in two and a half seconds, that's that's a pretty fast, you know, pretty pretty fast shift time. Yeah, um, and and not only that, you know, like we were talking before, you know, just to reiterate, you know, there are so many guys out there in their garage that have spent so much time building their own stuff, doing their own stuff. And we don't have a platform for that talent. We don't have a platform anymore for, you know, that knowledge. It seems like the platform is just about being fake and, and showing off your junk, you know, in order to, uh, you know, get a name out there. And I want to start showcasing the people in our world, in our society that are like me and you that said, you know what, I'm going to figure out how to do this. And I don't have to. And, and, but I'm gonna, and it doesn't matter how much money you got. It doesn't matter if you're a, if you're a millionaire and you come to my race or you're, or you're dirt poor, you come to my race and build your own stuff. We don't care. It's about the knowledge and about what, it, how far you pushed yourself. And I think we need more of that. Well, I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I find that our society is so preoccupied with like the immediate, right? I mean, immediate gratification. I don't care whether it's, you know, you, you want to pick up your phone and, and have something ordered and have it delivered in two hours or, or you need instant information um, that, that our society has gone away from its roots, which we were at one point a manufacturing society. Yes. You know, uh, we were an agrarian society and, and today it's, it's all about digits and, and, and instant satisfaction and what's in it for me. So for what it's worth, I think that that's something hopefully both of us give back to our viewers. And that is, um, we're, we're actually going to be shifting some gears and be, we're going to do some lower cost builds. Um, to do a $200,000 build, I think is very cool. But at the same time, most people can't identify with that. I want to do yeah. some $10,000 builds. And, and I'm not going to say we're going to do a $100 build because, you know, you can't even buy a spark, set of spark plugs for a hundred bucks anymore. But, right, right. but, you know, I, I think for $10,000, there are some cars out there and we're doing some of them right now. With $10,000 and a car that's been parked for 30 years, there are good ways, sort of like what Garage Squad did, go in, yes. let's not mess with the cosmetics too much. Let's just get this car over the hurdle, get it going down the road, inspire the owner to then have them Get out and polish your own paint and, and touch up the chips in it and, and, and clean or replace your carpet. So, so I, I'm, I'm hoping to inspire a few people in the car world that this stuff isn't rocket science. It just takes, you got to figure out which end of the wrench to grab. Um, you got to figure out which, which way the screwdriver turns. And, and, and then maybe, just maybe, you can start building your own dream too. So Then, then you know exactly what garage squad was all about and why i pushed so hard to be that way i mean i i mean we, you know i mean when you turn on tv you you have the you have we'll call it the, the rat rod life i mean you know that you see that everywhere and then you have you, know, you said the 200 300 dollar resto mods where was that middle road where was the where was that road for the the railroad worker that's got a yeah. 69 camaro in his garage that you know you know we don't have to pound in his head that hey don't even come out of the garage unless you got 200 grand in it, right. you know, or don't even come out of the garage unless it's a rusty pile of crap. You know, what about the guy that is going, I want to just do something nice, decent, presentable that I can be proud of. Yeah. And that's what garage squad was all about was trying to push that. And, and, and I hope, I, I hope great success with you with those bills doing that because I do believe in our car culture, it is important. I mean, it's went from, you know, patina is king, right? Let's be honest, patina is just 
people that don't want to do paint and body work, okay, to, you know, $100,000, you know, in parts alone, resto mods. Well, what about that in between? And and that's what I'm all about. I'm about an in between. I like both ends of the spectrum. I mean, I even got my own patina truck. I mean, but it's about that 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 middle road. Where where can we take people down that middle road and where they also feel appreciated for their efforts that they've done? And that's why, you know, with my production and builders brawl, that's only like the tip of the iceberg of what I have planned, you know, okay. for this idea. So that's why. I'm going to be following you a lot with those builds and you know, I'm going to be supporting you, you know, and, and I think it's a great idea. So, and like always, Dan, I, I always think you do some pretty cool stuff. And, um, I've had a lot of, a lot of respect for you since the first time I met you. I'll never get everybody. The first time I ever seen Dan short was at a velocity party <laughs> and he's wearing that shirt, probably that exact shirt. Yeah, it probably and, was the same one. I only have one. Yeah, and he's got dirt stains on his jeans, and he's leaning up against the couch, and he's talking to some people, and I have to look at this guy, and I went, now this guy gets me right here because he just doesn't care, and we hit it off right right out of the gate, you know? Yeah. And uh, so everybody watching, you know, Dan's the real deal, you know, and, and I, I – I think I am. I've been told by the network I'm the real deal. I just want to be me. And I think that's why me and you get along so well. I think it is. Well, Joe, I'm behind you 100%. I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, your releases as they come out. Uh, I will do everything I can to plug them one more time. The name of your series? Builders Brawl. You can check it out on buildersbrawl.com. Send in a submission, qualify as a builder, and you can come to Cordova, Illinois, and you can race your ride if you built it. Outstanding. Hey, Joe, thank you for joining me on this podcast. Uh, this is the first of many. Um, for everyone out there, uh, please stay with us. We're going to be doing additional podcasts with other great guests uh, talking about the car culture and the new world we're, uh, we're stepping into. Um, so from Phantom Works here in Norfolk, Virginia, Dan Short, uh, thank you again, and uh, we hope to see you uh, real soon.